this out of the way. Here. All right. All right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, this is actually the first Encompass Live of 2019. Yay. Welcome to 2019. I uh, hope we all have a good year uh, coming up. We'll have lots of good shows for you. We've got lots of things we're adding to the schedule. We'll see. Um, Encompass Live is the Nebraska Library Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover um, any topics that may be of interest to libraries and anyone who is staff at libraries. Uh, we broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every every week and then post it to our website later so you can watch at your convenience. And I will show you at the end of today's show where you can access those archives. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have the show um, recording is available, and if there are any presentations, um, slides, as there are for today's show, those will be available for you as well. Both the live show and the archives are free and open to anyone to watch. So um, definitely share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anybody who you think might be interested in any of the shows we have on. Um, we do a mixture of things here on Encompass Live, uh, book reviews, interviews, uh, mini training sessions, um, demos of services or products that we think may be of interest to you. Here in Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries, for all libraries, all types of libraries in the state. So you will find shows that we do um, that will cover any type of uh, library, public, uh, academic, K-12 schools, correction facilities, special museums, anything that's library, we will have something to do with them. Um, we do bring in guest speakers on Encompass Live, and we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that do sessions. Um, and today we have a mixture Yay. of that. Uh, with me today, sitting with me here, <coughs> is Sally Snyder, who is from the Nebraska Library Commission from here. She's our coordinator of Children and Young Adult Library Services. Good morning, Sally. Good morning. And remotely on the line with us is Jill Annis, who is a librarian at Elk Elkhorn Grandview Middle School uh, here. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. All right. And they do um, an annual, actually, um, presentation of this, uh, Best New Team Books of whatever you know, the previous year was. It's usually done in, somewhere near the end of whatever the year. So this is for 2018. Um, this is a session that's done at our state library conference. And then we re reproduce it here on the show to make sure that everyone can have access to this great info and all these good titles. Um, I personally, they, um, Sally actually does this, um, she has um, two of these, there's one for teen books, one session, and then a previous one that's already been done for children's books. So if you're looking for something, and well, I'll show you where that is um, later, something for the uh, younger kids, we did have a previous session that was done on um, November. November. November, back in November 14th, yep. And it's in our archives, so you can watch that one if you're looking for one for the younger children and this one for our teens. But I will um, hand over to you guys to take it away and tell us all the best books that you guys read Yay. in 2018. <laughs> Just a quick um, heads up for people who haven't listened to us before. These are titles that Jill and or I have run across. Um, at the Library Commission, we receive review copies of some books from some publishers. So. I see some, if you see the room where they're all laid out on the shelves, it's a lot of books, but it's not everything from anybody, and some people don't send us anything, so it may not be representative of your favorite publisher, in which case I'm very sorry. I also look for books at the public library, and sometimes I buy books, and um, because I can't help myself. <laughs> and Jill runs across a, a different list of books, this year we read more of the same books than has happened before, yeah. but we still have plenty on our list, and we had to we had to arm wrestle for who got which title, <laughs> which was hard to do uh, over the telephone. But Jill won most of those fights because Sally's too sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have, if you see me here, I have a sheet with my blurbs written on it because otherwise I'll be talking still till three o'clock, and Jill will have gone home. And, and, <laughs> Chris will say, just uh, put things away your own self because I'm done here. So um, I try to stay on pace with yeah. things. And we should mention this handout that Sally's reading from. We do also have this posted to our website. 
right? We have the list of books yes. right now posted to our website. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You can find it by searching our website for the word handouts, and that'll mm -hmm. bring you to a link that'll take you to this whole page, and it'll say Encompass Live Handouts. Mm -hmm. And the handout with all of your order information, the ISBN and publisher and everything, are all on that page. So if you're just jotting down notes, just give yourself some cryptic notes so you know which title you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And that list is in the, the order that we're presenting, yes. And when the archive is set, um, is ready for this, the, the recording, uh, the link to the actual slides, but also a link to the handouts will be available to you as well. So you'll be able to print that out and have all of the more specific information that you need to actually purchase and order the books. And a little, a little while later, not today, but in the near future, um, if Jill sends me her blurbs, ha ha, um, then we will have a list with our our um, notes about what, what we said about each book. So if you can wait for that one, too, if you want to. Yeah. Because I know Jill will send it right away. <laughs> yes, I will. So we'll get going. And if you have, like she said, if you have questions as we go along, please. Oh, that's not working. There okay, we go. Use that. Now you're good. And we're good to go. Now you should be fine. Make sure you'll use it. Yeah, you want to. Yep. Okay, there we, there we go. So we start with, we're very kind of general because we. I try to be careful about using grade levels or age ranges because everybody's an individual and we all know that some younger kids read longer titles and some older kids don't want to take that no. long. They want to read the quicker titles. So there's no real line that we have on, it's just kind of who these might appeal to and Partly the age of the main characters, mm -hmm. uh, at least for me, that plays into which group I put it in. But for younger teens, we'll start with Jill. Oh, yes. This is the long-awaited sequel to The Crossover, and it follows Josh and Jordan's father, Charlie Bell, as a teenager following, following his father's sudden death. Charlie has a difficult time dealing with the loss of his father and begins to isolate himself in his room reading comics. Charlie then gets into trouble and his mom decides to send him off to his grandparents' house for the summer. There he learns about the hard work from his grandpa, good food from his grandma, and the love of basketball from his cousin Roxy. Will Charlie, aka Chuck, be able to rebound from the loss of his father or will trouble find him again? Excellent verse novel with basketball comics depicted throughout. The book is set in 1988, but the book crossover and rebound connect together at the end. Great book for reluctant readers, basketball fans, and for anyone who has lost an important family member as grandpa gives great life lessons for teenagers. Hmm. Wonderful. Maddie, 16-year-old Maddie and Logan have been best friends since they were kids. Maddie's dad was a Secret Service agent for Logan's dad, the President of the United States. After Maddie's father is injured in the line of duty saving Logan's mother from being kidnapped by Russians, he decides to move the two of them to the remote wilderness of Alaska. Maddie writes to Logan every week, but Logan never responds to her letters. As a punishment, Logan's father says, sends him to Maddie's house in Alaska six years later. Maddie wants to kill him, but he has to tr but has to try to save him first after he is kidnapped by a Russian. Is this kidnapping tied to his mother's years ago? Will the two teenagers make it out alive? Suspenseful middle grade book that teaches the reader about Alaska and their survival skills needed to live in the wilderness. And that's a golden sower for next year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, is it? Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. As is this book, and yeah. I absolutely adored this one. 12 year old Mason hey, Buttle is book. filled hey. with kindness and hey, compassion. Hey, Jill. Yes. This one's mine. Oh, I'm so sorry. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. My bad. Should. That's okay. I should have just let you go, but you get the next no, one. No, no, no. So actually, for because we do have people who are uh, sign up for this one that aren't oh, from here, right. um, explain about the Golden Sower quickly. The, the Golden Sower is our state um, children and teens. Um, what's kids the Choice children? Award. Children's Choice, Choice Award. Yeah, That's the kids yes. they, they vote on it. And there's three levels. There's picture books, chapter books, and novels. And novels mm -hmm. are aimed at um, this age group, the mm -hmm. sixth through eighth. Yep. Yeah. So. Sorry, sorry, yeah, Sally. Go for it. No, that's okay. okay. I'll just, I'll just yell mine. <laughs> okay, go for it. 
Mason is 12 and he calls himself the largest, sweatiest kid in seventh grade. He does his best, but it never seems to be enough. His best friend Benny died after falling from a treehouse, and Lieutenant Baird keeps stopping by to ask Mason about it. Mason cannot talk to him. He is physically unable to. And so the lieutenant, lieutenant continues to believe he is hiding something, and it might be Mason's fault. The neighbor boy is a bully and encourages his friends to bully Mason. A new friend, Calvin Chumsky, is small and bright and brings Mason hope for a better life. When Calvin disappears, Mason is once again under suspicion. Friendship, bullying, hardship, loss, and finally getting one say about a tragic event. Go Jill. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Ten-year-old Louie hasn't done a great job of taking care of pets in his lifetime. A few of his pets that have died or went missing were a snake, hamster, goldfish, and lizard. One day, Louie's dad brings home a weak, orphaned mini donkey from his Uncle Pete's farm. He mm. knows that his luck with animals is about to change. Louie mm. wants to make a difference like his brother, Gus, who is stationed out of state in the Army. His new friend, Nora, has doubts that Louie can save Winslow. Can Louie nurse the donkey back to health, or will he experience another loss? Themes of friendship, love, overcoming obstacles to reach a goal. Great for fans of Charlotte's Web, Love That Dog, and Moo. I love that. <laughs> My turn. Quinn is a high school freshman, and her family, she and her family have moved from Colorado to Massachusetts for a new school for her younger brother, Julius, who is on the autism spectrum. This is good for Quinn, too. She has lost all of her hair to alopecia, alopecia, I always say that wrong, <laughs> And a fresh start is great since Colorado is where her friends backed away from her. And then there was a sexual harassment episode that wouldn't go away. Now in Gulf Head, Massachusetts, she will wear a wig and no one will know about her alopecia. Mm -hmm. Instead, she worries the wig will fall off or move and it itches like crazy. Mm -hmm. At her new school, she makes friends and learns a bit about Nick, who is in a wheelchair and not friendly in study hall. He has his reasons for being rude. Good friends are worth gold, and Quinn has found them at her new school, though she is afraid to trust them at first. Helping her brother can be tough, but he is only being himself. Nick is now another new friend for her. He has his own issues, but also begins to show con a considerate side. As School Library Journal mentions, readers of The Running Dream or The Fault in Our Stars will likely pick this one up. And for Jill... Brody, an obedient and loyal dog, has just died and entered an area for dogs waiting to go to their forever place. Brody knows there is something pressing he must do before he enters. It takes time for Brody to remember his past and realize he must go back to Earth to save Brody's owner, Aiden, from his abusive father. With the assistance of a terrier named Tuck, the pair of dogs are challenged along their journey to learn how to keep their souls from being stolen piece by piece by a pack of angry and hungry dogs. Will Brody and Tuck find Aiden and rescue him from his father before their souls completely disappear? Action-packed fantasy for animal lovers and fans of a Dog's Purpose series. <laughs> Ghost dogs. And between the lines is a companion book, Bronx, Bronx Masquerade, which was a 2001 title that won the Coretta Scott King Author Award. In this book, starting with Darian in 11th grade, who eventually wants to write for the New York Times, we meet nine students in Mr. Ward's poetry class. Open mic day is each Friday, and Mr. Ward gives writing prompts to help the students focus on memories and ideas that may make good poems. Each student has his or her own situation and issues realistically portrayed. A poetry slam will be putting the girls with a Z against the team and the boys with a Z team against each other. Lots of learning, bonding, and realization of other slides makes a terrific book. Now Jill gets the next four titles, so well, <laughs> go Jill. Go Jill. <laughs> All right. This is scary. Oh, this is, this is just a little scary. scary. A ghost story? 
12-year-old Jules is used to moving from town to town and into very old houses. Her dad's construction company specializes in historical restoration. However, this deteriorated Virginia mansion is different. Jules can feel it in her bones. It is haunted. She starts having visions of the past of a young girl who is trapped in a locked upstairs room with angry men on horses outside the house. Told in dual perspectives of Jules and the girl in the locked room. Can Jules help to set the girl free or will she be trapped in the house forever? Another great ghost book told by master storyteller Mary Downing Hahn that will fly off the library shelves. The mm -hmm. audio was extremely engaging for a long road trip. Uh -huh. 12-year-old Jason just received the shock of his life. His mother has been in the U.S. illegally since the death of his father in Afghanistan. One day he fear, his fears come to life when his mother is escorted from her work by two uniformed officers. Jason panics and decides to take the train from New Jersey to New York City to find his auntie Seema. During the chaos of the train station, Jason hits his head and lands himself in the hospital. There, he befriends a girl named Max. They come up with a plan to break out of the hospital. The only problem is, is that Max is really sick and Jason has no idea. Will the pair locate Auntie Seema or will Max have an episode during their adventure? Timely, realistic fiction book that will have readers rooting for Jason and Max to succeed. Perfect for fans of Inside Out and Back Again. Is this me? Yes, it is. Okay. 13-year-old <laughs> Amelia Peabody continues to grieve the loss of her sister, Clara, from three years ago. At the beginning of eighth grade, Amelia is expected to receive an inspirational letter she wrote in sixth grade. However, her English teacher accidentally gives Amelia Clara's letter. After sharing the letter with her best friend Taylor, they decide that Amelia should attempt to complete Clara's list of goals activities in her letter. So Amelia must complete the following tasks. Make the softball team. Be nicer to mom. Throw a birthday party at the lake. Ask Billy to dance and have the best eighth grade prank the town has ever seen. Each activity is difficult for Amelia to complete, and she must reach deep down inside herself and come out of her shell in order to be successful. Touching story that will help our students cope with grief when their wor worlds have been turned upside down. Great for fans of Wonder, Counting by Sevens, and Wild Bird. One more for you, Jill. Okay. 12-year-old Levi was a very sick baby who was in and out of hospitals for the first few years of his life with breathing and lung issues. His older brother, Timothy, once stole a credit card to pay for his medicine. Timothy landed himself in juvie, and the first book, House Arrest, was the journal of his one-year probation. Fast forward 10 years, and Knockout follows Levi beginning middle school. His mom and Timothy still watch over him like he is wounded, but Levi decides to rebel this year. His dad enrolls him into boxing without his mom's knowledge, and he fakes going to chess club for other fun events. Great verse novel depicting the importance of family and friends through Levi's rocky road of middle school and health scares, a must read for house arrest fans. Lifeboat 12 is told in free verse and is based on a true story. Kenneth Sparks, 13, and his family are beginning to experience the Blitz of London during World War II. Ken has been accepted to travel to Canada as part of the Children's Overseas Reception Board to send British children to safer shores. His trip with 89 other children and paying travelers aboard the city of Benares at first is luxury, all the food they want, new toys to play with, and then the ship is hit by a torpedo. Ken ends up in Lifeboat 12 with five other boys, some ship staff, a priest, and a lady teacher. They have limited supplies and must decide whether to try to stay near the sinking area or
for Ken Sparks, and there are photos and other details at the back of the book. The treatment of the Lascars as lesser people is noted as well. Quite a powerful book. I was noticing that this says the, this uh, when you did oh, the yeah. screenshot of the book cover, it's an advanced reader copy, or yes. advanced reviewer copy, but it has been published. Yes, I yes, looked it up. Yes. It came so, out. It actually did come out in September. This, so this is, is the copy. Yeah, the copy yeah. I received from the publisher. Um, Simon Earlier, Schuster sent, sent me several um, advanced reviewer right. copies, and so yeah, that's good. Um, Just so Joe, it is available. Thanks for pointing that yeah. out. Joe has the next two titles. 12-year-old Charlotte Lockard from Pennsylvania and 11-year-old Ben Boxer from Louisiana live over a thousand miles apart, but they are both experiencing stressful life events. Connected as online friends playing Scrabble, the two reach out to each other to help cope with family and middle school issues. Charlotte is beginning to lose her closest childhood friend and Ben's parents are planning to divorce. Told in alternating chapters of Charlotte and Ben, this heartwarming novel explains that every child needs a friend and it brings two students together who didn't fit in with the crowd and figure out how to overcome that challenge together. Great book for fans of one Wonder and perfect for the hashtag be kind movement. 13 year old Donovan Curtis is back at his regular middle school this year, but his super gifted friends Noah, I can't pronounce his last name, Euclidus, has joined him after being kicked out of the academy for this for scholastic distinction. Noah's goal, it, goal is to become ordinary as possible or to finally be challenged. Noah's first step is joining the cheerleading squad, which upsets star athlete hashtag and cheerleader captain Megan. Donovan finds himself at the wrong place at the wrong time and ends up becoming a hero, but he must keep it a secret as hashtag has leverage against him. This is where Noah steps in, steps up to the plate. Will Noah help Donovan's predicament or end up making the situation even worse? Funny page-turning second installment in the Ungifted series will leave readers highly satisfied. And Gordon Corman has been busy this year because uh -huh. another book that st stands on its own as of now anyway Cooper Vega is 12 and he's in seventh grade and he has a brand new top of the line cell phone as compensation for his family having to move again. His dad is in the military and they have moved a lot. So he is used to being referred to as what's his face. <laughs> this time they have landed in Stratford, a town that willingly changed its name when billionaire and Shakespeare fan, Mr. Wolfson chose to move to that town. This year, as tradition dictates, the seventh grade will perform a Shakespeare play, play. This time it's Romeo and Juliet. Cooper's cell phone has a glitch and he soon discovers it is a ghost in the machine. Roderick Northrup, 13, was a printer's apprentice during Shakespeare's time and he claims that Shakespeare stole his play, changing the names of the main characters from Barnab Barnabas and Ursula to Romeo and Juliet. Uh -huh. Roddy wants Cooper to help him prove the truth but it seems impossible. As one expects from Corman, this has plenty of humor as well as heart. The next book is another middle school story told from two girls' points of view using a format similar to her previous title, Invisible Emmy. Brianna's story is told all in graphic novel format and Izzy's story is told in text with illustrations. Brianna Bree gets all A's and C is seen as a brain. She does not want to be in the talent show, but she agrees in order to help her mom, who is in charge of it. Bree has major stage fright. Izzy loves to perform and prefers that over doing her homework. As Amazon says, the girls' lives converge in unexpected ways on the day of the school talent show, which turns out to be even more dramatic than either Bree or Izzy could have imagined. A third book from me, <laughs> well, just talking about it, this is um, part of the series that the, uh, the publisher is doing of the different uh, major um, superheroes. Batman is one of the first ones that came out. And this, Bruce Wayne has just celebrated his 18th birthday, and he was driving his new car a little faster than he should have, and he uh, got, surprise, surprise. <laughs> got in trouble, and now he has to do, what's it, compensation? That's not the I didn't write it down. Um. Community service. Community service. That's yeah. right. Okay. And yeah. he has to go to the Arkham Asylum, and mm -hmm. there he ends up 
encountering the Madeline Wallace, a brilliant killer. She has ties to the Night Walkers, who are some kind of nefarious group that he's not quite sure what they're up to either. <laughs> and she has insisted she will only speak to Bruce. And he doesn't know if it's because she thinks she can manipulate him or if there's something that she wants to convey to him that she can't to other people. Hmm. But something is up, and he's not sure what it is. He's not Batman yet. I was going to say, if he's only 18, is yeah. he has he even done that whole Batman no, is he Batman? Yet? He's no. really discovering all of the um, their businesses, mm -hmm. various mm -hmm. amazing tools mm -hmm. and equipment. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of a pre-Batman awareness. Mm -hmm. hmm. Quite interesting. Oh look, I get to go some more. <laughs> One more. Clay is twelve, and he loves being a wide receiver for his Pop Warner team. He and quarterback David Guerrero have a connection that is sometimes uncanny. Then one day, Clay is hit hard and has some trouble recovering while hiding his hurt on the field. He slows down to miss another pass and then feels guilty for it because he did that on purpose. Clay works through his issue, but he also begins to worry about their coach. His coach played for the Dallas Cowboys and with a mother who was concerned about the effects of concussions, Clay has begun to notice some slippage, some confusions, and some forgetfulness by his coach, and he isn't sure quite what he should do. Mm -hmm. Back to Jill. Ten-year-old Livy lives in Massachusetts and hasn't been to visit her gran in Australia for five years. When Livy arrives for a trip, she is overwhelmed by the feeling that she has forgotten something very important. She goes upstairs to her room and opens the closet and finds Bob, a small zombie-like creature dressed in a chicken suit. Bob has been eagerly and loyally waiting Livy's return down under. Livy and Bob rekindle their friendship, but they also remember Livy's promise to help find Bob's true home. Could the answer Bob seeks be found inside the pages of a children's book? This book portrays themes of friendship, love, magic, and never giving up. Great shorter fantasy book for the middle grade audience. 12-year-old Lucy has the nickname Lightning Girl because she was struck by lightning. Lucy recovered quickly, but she was left with a couple of side effects. She is now a math genius with some OCD tendencies. Her grandma has been homeschooling and letting Lucy take online classes. Lucy's grandma and uncle decide that Lucy needs to start attending school with other students her age. So she is off to middle school with her hand sanitizer wipes and odd sitting routine. Will Lucy make a friend or will she become a target of a bully? Definitely for fans of Fish in a Tree, Wonder, and Out of My Mind, it was a great audio read. Hmm. Twinkle Mera is working toward becoming a filmmaker. She's just really quiet about it. She is also crushing on the school's favorite guy, Neil Roy, but he doesn't know she exists. Then Neil's twin brother, Sahil, identical but different in so many ways, asks her to direct a movie for the summer festival and offers to help as producer. She goes for it. Directing plus potential closeness to her crust. <laughs> yes, please. She gets a bit carried away with seeking the truth to show to the world as a good documentary filmmaker would, but her friends are able to bring her back to reality and help her realize that um, that that direction she was going wasn't the right one for mm -hmm. her. Jill. Told in dual perspectives of 16-year-old Kestra, daughter of the Cruel King's right-hand man, and 16-year-old Simon, one of the rebels who kidnap Kestra and try to blackmail her into helping them find the lost Olden Blade. Whoever possesses the Olden Blade will be able to kill the immortal king and name the predecessor. 
Kestra reluctantly agrees to Simon's plans because she doesn't want to see her servants killed. Will Kestra and Simon be able to locate the lost Olden Blade in the palace before Kestra has to be married off? Suspenseful middle grade fantasy novel that will keep you guessing until the very end. Looking forward to the second installment. And this was also a great audio read. Janie has been staying in the shadows, trying to be invisible in middle school, particularly because she does not want to draw the attention of Dagmar Hagen, the bully of the school. But one day, a girl shows up, well, she thinks it's a girl, shows up in this outfit and says, Have no fear, citizens. Captain Superlative is here to make all troubles disappear. Mm -hmm. And she runs down the hall helping people doing things like holding the door open for someone, stopping a bully, being positive. And she's also kind to Dagmar, the school bully. Well, Janie is completely enthralled in who is this and why are they doing this? And so she ends up being the new sidekick. But superheroes hold secrets and Captain Superlative is no exception. When Janie finds out what's truly going on, she's forced to face her own dark secrets and discover what it means to be a friend. And that's a very important thing. This is a debut novel, and I think it's uh, really strong. And I think the idea of anyone showing up in middle school in an outfit with a cape and <laughs> blue hair, and that's just, that's just a strong person. Very brave, <laughs> yes. Go Jill. 12-year-old Jerome is another African-American who is a victim of a fatal gunshot wound by the hands of a white police officer. A concerned citizen calls 911 saying a man has a gun in the park. Jerome's toy gun is mistaken for a real one, which costs him his life. He returns to Chicago as a ghost, and ironically, the only other living person who can see him is Sarah, the police officer's daughter. Jerome tries to explain to Sarah that her father's rea reaction to him in the park was a result of deep ingrained racism. Jerome is visited by the ghost of Emmett Till, and he learns how Emmett was also murdered in 1955. History continues to repeat itself. Sarah and Jerome must find a way to work together in order for their families to heal from this tragedy. Rhodes portrays the real pain of racial injustice in a way that's appropriate for middle school students who want to read The Hate You Give. 12-year-old Amal lives in a small village in Pakistan where she loves attending school and wants to become a teacher in the future. Her dreams must go on hold after the birth of her youngest sister. Amal is the oldest daughter, so she must stop attending school and stay home to run the household while her mother is recovering from postpartum depression. Amal becomes so frustrated with her situation at home, she lashes out at the market when she is almost ran over by a fancy car. The man doesn't ask if she's okay, but he demands that she hand over her right pomegranate. Amal refuses his request, and her family pays the ultimate price when they find out that Amal spoke back to the son of the wealthiest man in the village. As a punishment, Amal must go and become a servant to his family to pay off the growing debt of Amal's family. Sad look at corrupt leaders and how an entire village can pay the price. Will Amal be released from her servant duties or will she remain working for the Khan family the rest of her life? Will Amal ever reach her dreams? Wavy is 11, and right before her mother died, her mother gave Wavy a list of instructions to help her find her way in life, including this one. Be brave, Wavy B. You've got as much of a right to a good life as anybody, so find it. But little did Wavy's mom know that events would conspire to bring Wavy back to Conley Hollow, the Appalachian hometown her mother tried to leave behind. Now Wavy's back in the holler and in the clutches of her Aunt Samantha Rose. Samantha Rose is not interested in Wavy's welfare, only in the money that she collects for having taken her on. With the help of some new friends, Wavy might be able to prevent her aunt from becoming her legal guardian, 
and also find your place in the world. This is a full color graphic novel. Prince Sebastian's parents are ready for him to marry and keep presenting fine young princesses to him. He is not interested. When night falls, he becomes the talk of the city, Paris, by wearing amazing and daring dresses as the incredible Lady Cristalia, and the people love it. <laughs> sometimes in the morning he feels like Prince Sebastian, and sometimes he wakes up feeling he is Lady Cristalia. His best and only friend is Frances, an amazing dressmaker who must keep her role in Lady Cristalia's life a secret. That is a problem. Frances is poor and wants to become a great dress designer, but how long can she wait for this to come true? As it says on Amazon, Jen Wang weaves an exuberantly romantic tale of identity, young love, art, and family. A fairy tale for any age. <laughs> and now we'll go on to some nonfiction for teens. If this is a full color graphic nonfiction short biographies, if, I, if that's a category. <laughs> 20, it is now. It is, I yeah, just they, made it one. Just made one. Yeah. 29 women, 30 if you count the author's story at the back, are highlighted in this graphic novel style nonfiction title. The book's time frame jumps around and is not in chronological order. From Wu Zetian, born in 624 AD, up to women who are still living today. Each entry is about five to seven pages long. You might, note, you might think there is an issue with the many cultures being represented by one person, but my take on it, and this is just me, and I could be completely wrong, and I'm sorry if I am, because it's so brief about each person, the, the author is trying to present um, impact that the, the women had in the world. Um, I think an in-depth biography of any of these women should be done by someone of that culture. I agree with that. It is fascinating. I meant to read a, about a few women and then stop, but I read the whole book. <laughs> it. it was really awesome. wonderful. Sometimes it's easy to get through those little quick snippets and little yeah. shorter yeah. stories. And yeah. Like, oh, I never heard of this person. Um, this is from Canada. It's um, writings from numerous Native American women. And so, of course, it mostly focuses on Canada. But each entry is usually complete in one two-page spread. And you'll have some text and some artwork that rep represents that person's voice. So this is told by the Native American people who are telling their story. And so it is very representative of, again, particularly Canada. The variety of artwork, poetry, and narrative is amazing. Next is Jill. Hey Kiddo is a graphic novel memoir of author and illustrated Jarrett Krasa, uh, how do you pronounce that, Sally, his last name? Krasaska. Krosheka. Krosheska. Uh, I, I Garrett's look. graphic novel series that most students know is Lunch Lady. This memoir depicts Jarrett's childhood of living with his grandparents because his mother was in and out of jail for a drug addiction. Jarrett didn't know his father until later in high school, and his grandparents frequently argue and use very colorful language. No matter what Jarrett was dealt with in life, he didn't give up on his dream of being a comic book artist. Please read the author notes at the back because it really, um, you can see how his childhood, and this is just an amazing graphic novel that I highly recommend. Hmm. Jessica Long, now 26, was born in Siberia with fibular hemolia, I'm totally mispronouncing that, and adopted by an American couple from a Russian orphanage when she was 13, month, 13 months old. This photographic biography is filled with photos throughout Jessica's life, her favorite quotes, and stories of her journey of 10 years of competitive swimming in the Paralympic world. Jessica vividly describes her workouts, training, and each Olympic game that she participated in, inspiring biography that will teach students to set goals and work hard to achieve them. Scientist Kay Hollenkamp's research is the longest continuously running field study of any mammal in the world. She has been watching spotted hyenas for over 30 years, and this is a wonderful 
book with incredible photographs, of course, because the, I have not encountered a scientist in the field title that mm. has been less than wonderful. <laughs> um, as Kay says on page five, hyenas are incredible. They're the coolest animals out there because they are so weird. <laughs> It's another winner in this series, and it did get a starred review in Kirkus, for those who are looking at that. Speaking of inspirational, this is a poetry novella size inspirational um, writing that Jason Reynolds started for himself before he became successful. In a note at the beginning, he says, a letter to myself to keep from quitting. It was written when I was afraid, unsure, doubtful. And at first, I wasn't sure what it was. Um, he put this out there to encourage teens to keep trying and to keep working toward a dream. Even if you don't ever make it, the process is worth it. Mm -hmm. If 16-year-old Richard could turn back time to the day he was on the 57 bus with 17-year-old Sasha and his two buddies, I'm positive he would. This novel is not a work of fantasy, but a nonfiction book that describes two teenagers, one white and a gender, who is Sasha, and the other African-American Richard, and the events that led to Sasha being hospitalized and Richard locked up. Heartbreaking look at a hate crime and how the juvenile justice system works. Eye-opening novel and the best nonfiction book I've read in a long time. Now we go on to the um, non-specific fiction for older teens. <laughs> and starting with Jill. Zia Mara, 15-year-old, ha has been a fighter her entire life. Her name even means one who is ready for war. Z Zia Myra is a first generation Dominican American and has recently matured in height and stature, which has caused harassment by boys, men, and other girls her age. In order to cope with her anger, she finds moments of peace by writing in her poetry journal. Zia Myra's twin brother is perfect in her parents' eyes and is a model student and Catholic. Can the poetry slam her English teacher introduced in class help Zia Myra express herself and help her heal from the thoughts of not being good enough. Will her mother ever accept her for who she is? Themes of family, puberty, race, religion, and sexuality are portrayed in this powerful and heartwarming verse novel. Maya Aziz is 17 and she dreams of attending film school at NYU, but has not yet told her parents. They want her nearby at the University of Chicago and for her to marry a good Muslim young man. Her aunt is supportive of her dream and just after Maya gets permission to go to NYU and live with her aunt, a terrorist attack initially blamed on a man whose last name was also Aziz, a common name, everything falls apart. Her parents' business is attacked. Um, they're, they're living in a little bit of, not, the fear is everywhere, mm -hmm. actually. A school library journal says, it's a great examination of how hatred and fear affects both communities and individual lives. And this is very well done. And I was going to mention that I put this in the older group because of her age and her, her look toward college. Mm -hmm. But um, the things that are in this book, you could put it in a middle school um, collection as well and that will give you a chance to share some of these um, actions and feelings mm -hmm. with a younger crowd and I think that would be fine. This is a, again as Batman was this is an origin story of Wonder Woman who in this beginning of the book is 17 and is hoping to establish her life her right to live on Themyscira as she is not a battle proven warrior like everyone else on the island. Instead, she breaks an important rule by rescuing a human girl who turns out to be a war bringer, like mm -hmm. Helen of Troy. Mm -hmm. Only one thing can erase Alia's war bringer status, and Diana is determined to help her accomplish it, which means going with her into the world of men. A quest to save the world, discovering many things about the human world that she really just doesn't understand, mm -hmm. and finding people she can trust and some she cannot. Alia is biracial and considers herself black. 
strong writing, humor in Diana's lack of knowledge of American culture, and the overall fo focus of girls caring for each other makes this a good choice for collections. And with the popularity of the superhero mm -hmm. stories right now, this is a and Probably the Wonder Woman, Woman movie, which the next one I believe comes out next year. Oh, that's so, right. Yeah. Yay. So this is for Jill. 17-year-old Jude watched her mortal parents be brutally murdered when she was seven years old by the top soldier of Fairy. Taken to live in the high courts of Fairy with her older sister and twin sister, Jude must adapt to the Fairy way of life and she begins to long to become a knight and fully belong to this world. Many Fae despise humans and go out of their way to punish them, especially the youngest prince of the high court, Prince Cardin. The new king is about to be crowned, and Jude must aid the right prince in order to save Fairy from a massive civil war. Is a human capable of such a feat? brilliant written fantasy that depicts many problems, conflicts between family members and twins, fitting in fairy, and Jude's many internal struggles. Highly recommend this one, and the audio was amazing. And the second one is going to be coming out here, I believe, in in January. And I think it's called um, Evil King. I haven't read the first one yet. I've got to get busy. Mm -hmm. 15-year-old Kiva has spent her entire life believing she is living in ancient Alexandria. All of her school classmates have been led to believe the same thing. The reality of Earth no longer existing hit one day when her best friend Seth dies, but Kiva later finds him alive on a spaceship after she awoke from a deep sleep. Kiva also isn't happy that Seth has been awake for three years and he let her continue to live a lie. The home shuttle is in desperate need of a new part to function. So Kiva and Seth must put aside their differences to locate another ship, but not all ships are friendly. Fast paced science fiction thriller where the teens must work together to fight to save civilization. <laughs> The pressure is slowly getting to my, she's 17, and she's in her first year of college because she skipped a grade. Her Taiwanese parents expect her to become a doctor and to marry a good, successful Taiwanese gentleman, too. She overreacts to germs using hand cleaner at every opportunity and cannot imagine what she would face as a doctor. She loves dance and loves teaching it to all ages, but that is not an acceptable career for her parents to consider. Also, she is interested in a fellow student who is Japanese American, and her parents will not tolerate that either. And so she is um, struggling with what she wants, what her parents want for her, and also her older brother who has already stepped outside the family expectations mm -hmm. by marrying or wanting to marry another um, person. So all of this is coming to a head, and she's starting to feel stomach issues, etc., from all of this happening. This is book one of a series. I'm not sure how many they'll be. All six of this year's bells are ready for their debut at the Bow Carnival, where they will display their skills at beautifying the people of Orléans, and one will be chosen as the favorite of the queen. But when they are assigned their stations and begin to work in earnest, Camellia, who wanted to be the favorite but didn't get that, begins to see the ugly side of things. Can she and her sisters make things better, or is everything already under the cruel younger princess's control? Slow to start, but the royal intrigue, a touch of romance, and the fascination with beauty treatments, how they can change a person, will capture readers' attention. 16-year-old Olivia, Olivia Blakely is constantly in the spotlight thanks to her politician father. Her junior year of high school is stressful enough, but now her father decides to run for governor of California. 
Her goal is to be accepted at art school so she can pursue her dream of becoming a painter. The pressure to portray a perfect life begins taking a toll on Liv. She's used to being able to turn to her artwork as an outlet. When that doesn't help, Liv begins drinking heavily, binging and purging food, and cutting herself to take away the pain. She tries hard to hide all of these issues from her two best friends and her family. Her problems begin to escalate, which could leave Olivia without her best friends or in the emergency room. Will Liv find someone to love and accept her? Will she find help before it's too late? heartbreaking look at bulimia and cutting from a teenager's point of view. Highly recommend to readers who want to understand these issues. Very difficult to read at time, but a necessity to teach our students empathy. Sixteen-year-old mm -hmm. Gabe and Elise have both fallen for the wrong person. Sasha, Gabe's girlfriend, is, is a controlling and deceiving person, and he is finding the right time to end the relationship. When Gabe is the victim of a hit and run, he falls for Catherine, the girl who called 911 to report the accident. When Gabe breaks up with Sasha, she becomes extremely jealous and very dangerous. Elise is thrilled when she earns the star role in Romeo and Juliet, and her handsome drama teacher begins spending extra practice sessions with her. Elise's home life is troubled, and Mr. Hunter takes advantage of that situation. Gabe and Elise's storylines seem unconnected until the reader discovers they are both in obsessive, abusive, and even illegal relationships. Told in alternate alternating perspectives, the suspenseful high school read is a misery meets a true crime episode for teenagers. <laughs> Have you ever felt that you were destined to come into contact with someone? Teenagers Freya, Haroon and Nathaniel have a chance meeting in a park in New York City where a freak accident occurs. Freya is a musician who has lost her voice. Haroon has just lost the love of his life, and Nathaniel is trying to find his father. All three teens are lost in their own way, but they need each other to put the pieces back together again. Heartbreaking look at three different losses and how complete strangers become each other's rock. I highly recommend the audiobook as the voices are perfect for each character. This is the long awaited new book uh -huh. by John Green. Um, 16 year old Aza or Aza it has some issues that she's dealing with, but her very best and most fearless friend, Daisy is eager for them to investigate the mystery of fugitive billionaire Russell Pickett, who has disappeared. There's a $100,000 reward at stake, and Daisy's quite interested in that. Plus, Aza used to be best friends with Pickett's son, Davis. So that's been a few years since they've seen each other, but Daisy is sure that that can be the, the thing that gets them the answer before anybody else. While this is a mystery about the disappearance of the father, it is more about Aza reconnecting with Dave, Dave Davis and also her dealing with her obsessive compulsive disorders and how that affects her life. She's trying very hard to control herself, but it is basically impossible. And this is a so it's a more slow moving and thought provoking, definitely a character study, mm -hmm. but very well written, of course, John Green and also as um, People may know John Green has an issue himself with, uh, I think he has obsessive compulsive disorder himself, mm. if I remember right. And so this is a very honest look at that situation. 16-year-old Holly Chase has turned into a Scrooge. She is greedy, self-absorbed, and only thinks about designer clothes. She has lost her best friend and barely sees her father, who's a movie director. One night, she is, a, she is visited by the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future in hopes of getting Holly to repent. She doesn't buy the act, 
dies and they've been and then becomes part of the top secret Project Scrooge organization in order to help reform others. Stuck at the age of 16, Holly becomes the ghost of Christmas past and keeps the position for the past six years. Something is quite different this year. Ethan, the new Scrooge, is 17, and Holly begins to see herself in him. How is this year going to play out? Filled with voice, suspense, and humor, I love this book, and the audio was very engaging. Daisy is 16, and she is out of her element when she and her parents joined her older sister, Eleanor, in Scotland to meet her fiancé's parents, the King and Queen of Scotland. Oh. No, you just have to remember that this is a book. It's fiction. <laughs> Daisy tries, but occasionally she speaks her mind. She is too much like her father, and she ends up insulting the king's sister. But the common people love it because the king's sister is kind of a snob. <laughs> Still, when she is photographed with the prince's younger brother, they must stifle the idea that they are a couple. This was complete an accident. They are not interested in each other. So she must fake date a friend of the family, Miles. A fun royal romance with a sense of the life famous people live, constantly being conscious of how things might look to others and how being yourself can cause problems for your family. For people looking for a, a sweet romantic romp with royal family members, mm -hmm. this is a great choice, and I think they'll be happy they took it off the shelf. 16-year-old Adam Reed has a ticket to a better life for himself, and it is basketball. In the short couple of years since arriving from Poland, Adam continues to improve his game on a daily ba basis because of his drive to get better. Because of this, Adam gets selected to play on one of the top Minnesota 17 under AAU basketball teams. After a few glitches at the beginning, Adam begins to fit in and the team begins to mesh well together. An arrest of one of Adam's teammates turns the team upside down. Will the team get over this difficulty? Themes of bullying, racism, teamwork, and overcoming obstacles are portrayed. Adam's character is developed so well that readers will be thinking about him long after they finish the novel. It was one of my favorite sports books that I've read so far. And this is also a Golden Sower nominee for... Is it not for 2019 and 20? I believe you're right, Sally. Yes. Okay. You can't see this cover very well, maybe. But that comes out okay on the screen. Okay. Yeah. Our wall here is not. Oh, okay. but we're is not always the best. <laughs> this is the is first dark, of a book though. of a two book series, a duology. In an alternate history, the Civil War ended because the dead began to rise from the battlefield. So, oh, oh, that'll do it. A new law took <laughs> effect: the Native and Negro Reeducation Act which forced all their children to learn how to fight the shamblers, as they call them, and hope for a job as an attendant to a wealthy family. Jane McKean is attending a well-known school, but she is railroaded into being sent west to a newly formed town that is the hope of the wealthy east. All is not well, and it doesn't take Jane long to realize that everyone needs to leave town. But if they do, where will they go with the Shambler seemingly everywhere? Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much where this first book ends is they're yeah. leaving town. But there's so I have to wait for book two. I was going to say, is the second one out at all yet? No, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, they leave two. you hanging. It does. <laughs> and this is a thicker book, but it, things move right along. Yeah. And the main character, Jane, is very talented, very skilled. And you uh, appreciate her abilities because some other people are more, t tend more towards shock and being stunned. You can't, mm -hmm. you don't have time for that. Sorry, yeah. I'm talking too much. No. <laughs> oh, here we go. Claudia. This book just broke my heart. Claudia can't wait to see her best friend again on the first day of eighth grade since she just returned from her grandma's house where she spent the summer. But Monday, her friend does not come to school. All through the book, Claudia tries to find Monday and asks for help from many people many times. The story jumps around with chapter headings of the before, the after, and one year before the before. Hints are dropped about Monday's life, and Claudia is struggling in her schoolwork and her social life, or the lack of it. It is heartbreaking. While Claudia is in eighth grade for a lot of this novel, this might be best for high school readers. Crude language and activities are presented, 
And what has happened to Monday is, as I said, heart speaking. This is a wonderful author. I think this is her second book she wrote, allegedly, that I talked about last year, which was also incredible. 16-year-old Stevie Bell is obsessed with true crime, and her deepest wish is to see a dead body. There's no better school for her to attend than the prestigious Ellingham Academy, where in 1936, one of the nation's notorious crimes occurred. The wife and daughter of millionaire and school founder Albert Ellingham went missing. Only one clue was left, a rhyming note signed truly devious. Stevie's goal is to solve the cold case of 1936 in her first year at school. When truly devious returns and a classmate is murdered, the past has come back to haunt Stevie and the other students at Ellingham Academy. Two mysteries told in alternating chapters and plot twists will keep readers' attention and they will long to read the sequel, The Vanishing Stare, to hit bookstores January 22nd. Ooh. Yay! <laughs> I can't wait. In this fantasy novel, Anda is the daughter of a human man and of the Lady of the Lake, Lake Superior. She feeds from the lake and causes ships to sink and people to drown mostly in November. Hector has come to Isle Royale to hide over the winter while it is closed until his 18th birthday in May. He has a good reason. But it turns out he is not as prepared as he thought because, of course, he encounters Anda, and they have a relationship. But he begins to discover what she is really about and what he doesn't know if he can um, handle that or not. There's wonderful writing, a blending of reality and fantasy it was an interesting combination, and you're left with the idea that they're to keep looking because there is always another way. This is the young adult novel winner of the 2018 Nebraska Center for the Book Children and Teen Book Award, and the author lives in Omaha. Nice. 17-year-old Hendrix and Ellison come from different worlds. When they meet, they are instantly attracted to each other. The only problem is Drix is a convicted criminal and Ellie is the daughter of the governor who enrolled Drix into the Second Chance program. They decide to remain friends, but the more time they spend together, the harder it gets. When Ellie finds out that Drix didn't commit the crime, she will risk everything to clear his name. Told in alternating perspectives, this is, novel is perfect for Sarah Dessen fans. Will, 16, has to walk. Page five, he says, sometimes you got to walk the day out of you, you know? Walk it right out through the soles of your feet. His father committed suicide when Will was 13, and now his best friend, Playa, was raped at a party he attended but left early, too early to help her. He works at Dollar Only, tries to recreate his father's cornbread recipe, and he begins to leave small gifts for a young boy he calls Little Butterfly Dude, just because <laughs> he thought the kid was great. Um, Bureau for the Center of Children's Books. I can remember what the B stood <laughs> oh, yeah, for. Oh, yeah, acronym, yeah. They say the book unfolds in a series of 100 vignettes, each 100 words long, each marked by a Chinese number from 1 to 100, which mm -hmm. I really mm -hmm. wondered what those were. I was so happy to read this and find <laughs> this out. And Publishers Weekly says, ultimately, the piercing narrative offers an affirmation of remaining connected to others through loss as Will embraces his relationships and begins to heal. And they both said that so well, I just... Let them say the, the review. 17-year-old Kay Donovan is in the popular crowd and in the center of a group of girls who rule the school at Bates Academy, an all-girls boarding school. Kay is the captain of the soccer team and well on her way to achieving her dreams until one night when she and her friends go to the lake after a dance and they find a dead girl with her arms slashed in the water. When Kay receives an email the next day, she is blackmailed into ruining the lives of her friends in a digital scavenger hunt. 
Kay is determined to clear her name, but there is still a killer on the loose. Will Kay be able to clear her name before she loses all of her friends or die trying? Mystery, betrayal, intrigue, bullying, suspense, and revenge will keep readers hooked in this chilling tale. 17-year-old Corey and Kyra have been best friends since they were kids in Lost Creek, Alaska. Corey must move away from the small town and start over when her mom gets a job out of state. Kyra tried writing to Corey several times, but her letters went unanswered. Just days before Corey is set to visit Lost Creek, she finds out that Kyra has died. Now she must go back and mourn her best friend instead of reconnecting. When she arrives back home, Corey suspects that the town is hiding something from her. Kyra was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and the town has never accepted Kyra until the last few months. Something doesn't feel right to Corey, and she is set out to find the answer, uh, answers of Kyra's death, except the townsfolk are not forthcoming and are treating Corey as an outsider. Will Corey find her answers or die trying? Interesting look at mental illness and the small town's reactions. Theo Foster wonders who posted that photo on his Twitter account. He was expelled for it but he didn't do it. He is working at the mini mart when Sasha Ellis walks up to him. She was also expelled for something she didn't do. Now they both want to learn who did the deeds and why. High school basketball players and once best friends Bunny and Nazir grew up in the same neighborhood their entire life. Then without telling Nazir, Bunny transfers to an elite high school where he has a better shot at a college scholarship. Bunny not only switches schools, but he's also going out with Kiona, the girl Nazir has dreamed of dating. Bunny enjoys basketball at his new school, but he is struggling with being one of the few black students at St. Sebastian, so he decides to reach out to his best friend. Nazir is hurt by Bunny's actions and is more concerned about his cousin Wallace's gambling debt. To make money fast, Wallace decides to bet against Bunny's team and wants Nazir to have Bunny throw the game. Did Bunny make the right deci decision transferring? Will Nazir help Wallace? Told in alternating chapters of Nazir and Bunny, themes of friendship, loyalty, integrity, and dedication will keep the readers intrigued until the explosive conclusion. Next. 16-year-old <laughs> Theodosa was only six years old when her beloved country was invaded and her fire queen mother was murdered right in front of her. Theo has spent 10 long years as a prisoner of the Calavaxians and their evil king, Kaiser. The people of her country are now slaves of the empire and their magical gems are being mined to extinction. Theo was stripped of her real name, tortured, ridiculed, and nicknamed the Ash Princess. One night, Theo is forced to kill one of her own people. That is the moment she decides to fight back. Who can she trust in this cruel kingdom? Will Theo be able to win her country back? or will she die trying? This novel was my favorite read this summer and a blend of the winner's curse mixed with Red Queen. 17-year-old mm -hmm. Eldon lives in a mysterious small town of Madison. The town has a secret that no outsider can find out. Every resident is able to make a wish on his or her 18th birthday in a private cave. Most teenagers long for their wish day, but Eldon has seen the devastation that wishes have caused. His younger sister was in a terrible accident, and it is against the rules to wish her well again. Unfortunately, that is all Eldon can think about. Will Eldon make a wish after interviewing most of the town about their very own wishes? What could possibly go wrong? 
17-year-old Simon has always been a gamer who loves virtual reality. He believed the only way to get his friend Kat back from the grips of her stepfather was to purchase the latest gaming system so they could meet in other world together. When Simon's parents find out and destroy his headset, he must find a different way. Simon rushes to the party Kat is attending and a terrible accident lands Kat and the others in the hospital. Kat is diagnosed with locked-in syndrome, and the only way to heal her is by playing Otherworld with a new technology that attaches to her scalp. Kat's stepdad kicks Simon out of the hospital, and he has suspicions of Kat's therapy. Mysteriously, Simon receives his own scalp headset and is told to find Kat in the game and help her to the exit. These new headsets allow the gamer to feel, taste, and experience Otherworld like never before. The only problem is that Kat and Simon, plus all the others with this technology, could also die in the game. Mm -hmm. Good science fiction book for high school on up. A cliffhanger indie will make the reader want the second installment, and it was a great audio read, and the author actually read it. Those nice. darn cliffhanger endings? <laughs> This is the second installment in the Scythe series. Citra continues her role as Junior Scythe under Scythe Curie and making quite the impression. And Rowan has gone rogue and is picking off the corrupt size one by one as Scythe Lucifer. At the end of each chapter, the reader learns more about the Thunderhead's thoughts and feelings about humanity, overpopulation and the scythehood amazing sequel which leaves the reader longing for the next book and i believe the third installment comes out in september oh so long from now yeah I know. <laughs> well neil schusterman has also been busy he and his son jared have also have written together the book dry um it's been there's been a drought for a, i think three years and people have been told, don't fill your swimming pools, don't uh, water your lawn. And then one day on the news, they find out that this is in Southern, I think, well, it's in California. They found out that the two states that used to allow their water to flow into California have turned off, turned it off. Hmm. And all of a sudden they have nothing. Their taps are dry, it's called the tap out, and they have to figure out what they're going to do. Of course, their swimming pools have not been filled, so there's no water there for them. Mm -hmm. um, the, the government says, oh, yes, we're going to have these machines out by the beach that will turn the, the salt water into drinking water. But there are not enough sheen, machines. There are way too many people. Mm -hmm. Alyssa's parents go to get some of that water for their family. and They don't come back. So she and her younger brother have to decide what they're going to do. The neighbor family have been prepared for years for any kind of mm -hmm. situation like this. And they have water, and they have food, and they are under um, suspicion by other people in the community. Mm. But the son um, is um, likes Alyssa, and he helps her. And then they have to run because the neighbor's house gets broken into. Bad things are happening, and so she and her brother and the neighbor all take off and try to go find somewhere else where they can get water for themselves and maybe bring back for their families. This is um, a look at humanity at its worst mm -hmm. and how people can get that way very quickly. The neighbor boy has been, his father has been training him with this. This is what's going to happen first. This is how people are going to react. This is what their mindset will be. This is how this will change. And he kind of shares that with Alyssa until she's just had that enough of that. That's just, <laughs> it's, um, you're, you're rooting for them. You're rooting for the, most of the people they run into are trying to help themselves and others. They run into a few bad people and you just don't know if they're going to make it or not. Mm -hmm. um, before we go on, I should say we, we are going a little past our official 11 o'clock yes. ending of the show where we usually say 10 to 11, but that's okay. Um, this always happens with these ones. There's just too, too many good books to talk about. <laughs> Um, but we'll keep going. There's a few more titles left on the list that they have. I will go to the end if you need to um, leave because you only allotted this much time to watch the live show. That's fine. Um, it's all being recorded, and you'll be able to watch anything you missed uh, later on when you get the archive. Just want to let people know. We're going to go you. until we're done. That was good. <laughs> Justice McAllister is 17. He's a good student, never in trouble. 
and he was merely helping his former girlfriend. He was trying to stop her from driving when she was drunk. But the police officer, officer thought he was trying to kidnap her. He was arrested, put in handcuffs, and hauled to the police station. Um, finally, he's released to his family when they come to pick him up. He begins to write letters to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. while trying to understand how this could happen and why he was in that situation. Then he is in the car when his best friend is shot and killed by police, and now there is even more that Justice doesn't understand as he works to come to grips with it all. A completely different story, Amelia, 17, is one of the Mead Creamery girls, and that means a good job and plenty of camaraderie while the other, with the other girls working in the ice cream stand. This place has history, and they all respect it and each other. But this year, two days before opening, Amelia, the new head girl, finds Molly Mead, the founder of the stand, dead on the floor. Hmm. Finding one's strengths, seeing things from another's point of view, and a bit of romance combine for a satisfying story of woman power and independence. 16-year-old Autumn, Shay, and Logan all have one thing in common. They have each lost someone they love. Autumn's best friend, Tavia, died in a car accident. Shay's twin sister died of leukemia, and Logan's boyfriend died by suicide. Autumn must come out of her shell of silence to live in a world without her best friend. Shay is a strong student and runner who is having panic attacks since her sister's death. Logan begins to drink heavily and cannot concentrate on, his, on writing his new music. All three teens share a love of music and a separated band named Unraveling Lovely. Can music bring these three teens together to cope and heal from their losses? Amazing realistic fiction book for fans of The Serpent King, King and Love Letters to the Dead. And that is our list. If you, when you get the printout of the list, you'll notice that after the, these, this part, there's a list of new titles and popular series, and we're not going to talk about those today. But we just put them in there so that if you're they're on the hand um, for you, students or, or readers are following a series, you can know about the most recent ones in there. Mm -hmm. um, I think yeah, well um, let's get the. Uh, Website up so we can share this video before. See where the handouts are. There we go. So um, the handouts, um, as you go to the Nebraska Library Commission's website, nlc.nebraska.gov, and just go over here and search for handouts, and comes up with the only thing there. And this is a page where Sally posts all of her, all the lists she's done over the years. So here's the one um, that's for today's that she was reading off of. Um, and you can see here, this is what we're talking about. This is just the basic info for you, but there will be one with the blurbs that will be posted. True enough, <laughs> yes. Um, and if you're interested, whoops, uh, the previous ones you can see here are, are here as well. So uh, the one that was um, Universal Stories, which was for some reading program, the children's book one that I mentioned that she did previously is here as well. And any of the previous years, um, going back to the beginning of when she started doing this, which was pretty far back, 20, 2008. We just left them up there because yeah. I don't. I suppose eventually we should just keep it to within yeah. but ten years or something. These but. are good, you know, good lists. People want to go back and see what were some titles maybe they might have missed over the years um, that you guys talked about. Um, but they are all here, and this will all be linked to from uh, the archive, as I said. So, any so, thank you guys very much. Um, this is I say this every time I get lots of good ideas for books to buy for. Um, kids and teens that I need for, for gifts and whatnot, uh, sometimes for myself, depending. Yeah. <laughs> Get it at the library or buy your own so, copy. Yeah. Um, any last words from you or Jill that you want to share before we wrap up for this morning? Did anybody leave us any questions? Um, no, there wasn't anything that typed okay. in during the show. Anybody have anything right. you want to say? Any questions, comments, uh, books that you're interested in and wondering about, type into the questions section of the GoToWebinar interface. I always like to hear if you don't think of it now, but you're thinking, oh, there was that one book, and then you can just email me 
and I'll share it with Jill and say, oh, I remember it was this one, and, and I just wondered if you had read it, and I'll say, no, but I'm going to get it right now. No, I'm going to, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You can also, you can follow me on Goodreads under jannis at epsne.org, and I post all my reviews on Goodreads, and I have them linked to my Twitter account. That's Library Lady NE for Nebraska. So, right, you're really great. I'm too, I'm I'm too far behind. <laughs> no. I have a Twitter account. I used it once. I don't use it a lot, but I do link my Goodreads reviews to it. So, so they automatically feed okay, into there. Awesome. So yeah. so look for Jill there online. All right. So um, for Encompass Live, so far, Encompass Live, I'm going to go to our website, is the only thing on the internet called that so far. So if you Google it, that's what you oh, find is us yay. and all of our other archives. Um, so this is our main page here uh, where you can find our upcoming shows. But today's archive will be posted. It's being, you know, as soon as it's done processing, most likely by the end of the day today, everything will be up there. Um, our archive sessions are here where they are just the most recent ones at the top of the list going all the way back. So uh, this was last week's uh, Talking Books and Duplication and Demand. You can see we had a link to the recording. Um, this one had an extra video and a presentation with the same thing here. There'll be a link to the archive recording, the slides that we'll upload, and then there'll be a third one that'll be a link to that handouts page just to give you a quickie link right there to there from the recording. Um, and while we're here, I'll let you know this is our archives of the entire history of the show. We've got um, 2018. Last year was the 10th year of Encompass Live. We started back in January 2009, and we have all of our archives here. So you can do a search of everything if you want to, or you can just search the most recent uh, year's worth, 12 months months if you want something recent. Uh, but we are librarians, so we archive and historically keep everything. So we will have them all here. You'll note, though, that everything is dated. Um, so just double check the date of when something was originally broadcast to keep to know when that information was relevant. There will be things on here where the service might not exist anymore, or a website might not be there anymore, or things have changed drastically since we did the particular show. But that's why we have all the dates here, so you'll always know, um, you know, this was when that what was going on at that time. So pay attention to that when you watch any of our archives. Look, there's best new teen books of 2016. Oh, oh, wait, yeah, 2016. 2016. Yep. And the children's ones, yeah. So you can see them. We've done these every year, yeah. <laughs> so you can see the recordings of those. So uh, when this recording for today is ready, everyone who attended this morning and who rec uh, registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know that it's here and ready. Um, we also post out to our social media, too. We have a, um, to the commission's uh, Twitter, Facebook, um, we have a uh, Encompass Live Facebook page. So if you're a big user of Facebook, give us a like over there. Here's your reminder to log into today's show, and you will get um, notifications about when um, shows are coming up. No, I don't want to log in right now. Uh, reminders of when the most recent uh, recordings are available. So if you do um, use Facebook, you can get a couple of posts a week from us on Encompass Live there. So I hope you'll join us for next week's show uh, or any of our other future ones we've got coming in. We've got more coming. We are here every Wednesday morning. I'm working on more dates to fill in, you know, confirming some titles, so some sessions. So look for updates here. But next week's show, which uh, Sally kind of mentioned earlier, graphic novel collection and programming. Um, this is Russ Harper, who's the Youth Services Librarian at Omaha Public Library, is going to be joining us to talk about um, graphic novels. This was a session that he did actually at the Youth Services Retreat, I believe. Yes. Did you he, see it there? I don't did. know if you, Jill had, was there for that. No, I wasn't there for that. Okay. I so I might have to join this. Sure. <laughs> I think you should. He was excellent, and he didn't have so much a list of titles that you had to have, but mm -hmm. connections to titles that are already out on the Internet. So sure. you will find lots of tips on how to collect yeah. these kind of things, things that you might not be if you don't know a lot about comics or um, manga. He talks about two here in the description. So if you're interested in that or just want to see what it's all about, join us next week. Russ will be here with us. Um, and for any, I sign up for that. Any of our other upcoming shows? Um, nobody typed anything in while I've been chatting here, so I think that's it. We'll wrap it up. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning, Jill. Thank you, Jill. Thank you. Happy New Year to everyone. And happy New Year to everyone. Year. Um, thank you for joining us. This was a, a show that was rescheduled to today. It was originally supposed to be in the beginning of December. Um, we usually do do them in the end of the year. Um, but due to the commission, the Nebraska Library Commission is a state agency being closed for the um, 
President Bush's funeral today. Uh, we had to reschedule for today, so I'm glad everyone was able to join us this morning um, for the start of the new year. Everyone's raring to go, kind of. Absolutely. Sure. All, All right. right. I'm ready to read some more books. <laughs> All right. Thank you much, everyone, and we will see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye, Jill. Bye. <laughs>